Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five minute mystery is being brought to you by the NCIS. You mean the Naval Criminal Investigative Service is sponsoring our mystery? Well, I'm sure they would. I see. The story has them in it. But the NCIS doesn't know that. Do they need to? Yes. yes. Inspector Dunn, come in. Came as soon as I got your phone call. What's up, Lieutenant? Well, usually Navy intelligence doesn't call in anyone else on a case. But now we're dealing with murder. Mm -hmm. Does the name A-92 mean anything to you? A-92? Isn't that the Navy fighter that crashed in the test flight? That's right, Inspector. We have a Navy tackle the job of seeing what went wrong with the plane. That was no accident. It was sabotage. Sabotage? Yes. That means, besides losing a vital aircraft, we also lost a more vital test pilot. Sabotage caused his death, or, to be blunt, murder. That's where I come in. Yes, Mr. Clay. Tell me, Lieutenant, how did the A-92 happen to crash? Well, the plane was pretty well damaged by the time we reached it. But we did find marked indications that the landing gear had been tampered with. Wasn't the plane closely guarded before the test? Yes, it was. And with the exception of the ground crew, only three men came in contact with the plane. Well, who were they? Well, of course, it was Malloy, the pilot who was killed. Yeah. And then it was McGraw, who was another pilot, and Jager, who was the chief mechanic. Hmm. When could I question these two? Right away, if you want to. I've got them waiting in the next room. I'll call them in here. Uh, McGraw, Jagger, come in, please. Go, Lieutenant. Yeah. Boys, this is Inspector Dunn. How you doing, Sit down, won't you? McGraw here was to have been the pilot in the test. But he fractured his wrist a few days ago, so Malloy had to take over. You certainly were lucky, McGraw. You could have been in that crash instead of the other fellow. Yeah, you said it. Tell me, Jagger, what were your duties around the A-92 as chief mechanic? Well, after the ground crew got finished with the plane, I'd make the final check. Did you do that the day the A-92 crashed? Yes, Inspector, and I didn't find anything wrong with it. Can't understand it. That fighter could have been the most powerful thing on wings if it hadn't cracked up. There was nothing the A-92 couldn't do. Uh, she'd have made airplane history. Malloy, he didn't trust any of these new grease monkeys. He always wanted the plane to be given a last okay by Jager. Say, Inspector, uh, would you like the names of the ground crew? There might be a phony among them. No, Jager... I think I've got our saboteur. What do you mean? I mean, he's in this very room. Well, don't just sit there, Inspector. Tell us who he is. Yes. Certainly, gentlemen. Our combination murderer and saboteur is none other than Chief Mechanic Jager. What clue led the Inspector to believe that Jager is the guilty one? We'll give you the solution in a moment. But first... Okay. That isn't a lot of evidence to convict. Wrong. I doubt that the NCIS sponsored this story. I agree. What's wrong? These stories come from the 1940s. They do? In the 40s it didn't exist. What? They were called O-N-I. Office of Naval Intelligence. NCIS began in the year 1982. Okay. I'm an NCIS fan. I just wanted everyone to know that the show is doing its 1,000th episode this week. Why didn't you just say that? Let's get back to the story. And now, back to our story. What, me, a saboteur? Well, my job is to repair planes, not to destroy them. And your job is also to give the final okay on the A-92. Yeah, but... If anything had been done to the plane prior to your inspection, you would have noticed it. But no, there was nothing wrong with the A-92 till you gave it a final check and sabotaged it. But Inspector, why would he do a thing like that? Possibly for money, or maybe a possible grudge. I don't know now, Lieutenant, but I think the boys at headquarters will get that out of him quick enough. Come on, Jager, we're going to take a little ride. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, I'm not sure why NCIS needed help solving that one. O-N-I. Okay, O-N-I. Jagger didn't cover his tracks very well. Hence, his demise. So why call in the feds? I am not surprised you didn't get it. Oh, and why is that? Well, if you were any dumber than you are right now, I'd have to water you twice a week. Oh, that's a good one. What did I ever do to you guys? Is that you say? Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today we have a throwback edition of Johnny, Is It True? Featuring four stories that let you decide if they're real. Get ready to unravel the mystery and to try and figure it out. Then we have a story found by Gary Richardson and edited by me. Texas is a land of many legends. Some of them are just that, legends. But Lon Schuler's story titled Stampede Mesa has the ring of truth to it. And I think you're going to agree. We will end the show with a story from the old-time radio series X-1. One man's ship is another man's prison. Praise the ship. The book says, When the ship shall enter into the orbital pool of its destination, the motors will change in sound due to the increased anti-gravity component. A study is being made to interpret the meaning of the word destination which was lost some 4,000 years ago and has always been a subject for much controversy. But this need not concern you. Suffice to be reassured that the change in the sound of the motors is a part of the scheme of things. Return to the schedule. The ship is all. Praise the ship. The The ship ship is all. Praise the ship. The story is titled Sense of Wonder. Now, let's get this podcast started with an edition of our favorite guessing game, brought to you by Audible. Johnny, is this true? As you know by now, I like to surf the internet to find the strange and unusual. I do this in the name of the podcast, but the truth is, I would do it anyway, even if there was no podcast. What you're about to hear is... Johnny, is this true? I will tell you a story and then ask the question, did I make it up or is it true? Your job is to decide. Let's get started. Johnny, is this true? This time on Johnny, Is It True? We return to the root of the segment and read stories of the strange and unusual. The thing is, the stories could be made up by me, or they could be real. Your job is to decide. Let's get started. Story 1. Roy Robertson from Chicago, Illinois, had a very strange event happen to him. Once in a lifetime, really. Roy was at the intersection of Milwaukee, Damon, and North Avenue. While he was standing there, a bus lost control and was heading straight for him. Roy was sure he was going to die, but dived to the street in hopes that the bus would pass by. Meanwhile, the driver regained control and managed to turn the bus at the very last second. Roy was saved. He promptly stood up and was jumping for joy when a pigeon, flying low, struck him in the head, causing him to fall back to the ground, unconscious. When the paramedics arrived, he was revived, and the very first words he spoke were, Did you get the license of that pigeon? To which the paramedic had sad news to report. You see, the bird died on impact. Now, if that isn't a foul story, I don't know what is. Well, if you thought this happened, you were truly duped. 
I created this off the top of my head and hasn't a shred of truth to it. That's not to say it couldn't happen. Story 2 As we get closer to Thanksgiving, why not a story about a notoriously foul turkey who spent months attacking people in the Bay Area before it was finally captured? Nicknamed Gerald, the belligerent bird ruffled the feathers of Oakland residents for about five months, pouncing on visitors to the neighborhood's Morecambe Rose Garden. Officials were forced to close the park out of concern for public safety. Animal Services said it received dozens of complaints about the aggressive gobbler, whose favorite target seemed to be elderly women. Gerald was finally caught by Rebecca Dimitrik, director of Wildlife Emergency Services, who disguised herself as a frail elderly woman and then baited the bird with blueberries, kibble, and sunflower seeds. When Gerald predictably charged her, she scruffed the turkey, grabbing him by the neck in a way that didn't actually hurt the bird. He was then safely released back into the wild. Now, is this skullduggery real, or did I just make it up? Well, this one is totally true. Residents described the turkey as charging at them, jumping on them, and clawing and pecking incessantly as they tried to run away. He was one foul bird. Get it? That's the second reference to foul in the segment. Maybe there is a theme. Story 3 Sacre fly! An elderly Frenchman blew up part of his house while chasing a fly. The 82-year-old was sitting down to dinner in southwest France when the bug came buzzing. So he began swatting at it with an electric racket designed to kill insects, not realizing that a gas canister was leaking into his home. The reaction between the racket and the gas sparked an explosion, destroying the kitchen and part of the roof. Fortunately, the octogenarian sustained only a slight burn to his hand. He was forced to stay at a local campsite while his family repaired his house. Unfortunately, the fate of the fly wasn't known. Now, while this isn't a foul story, it is pretty fly, isn't it? It is. This really happened in September of 2020. No charges were brought against the man for a fly massacre. However, he has sworn not to harm any more of God's winged beasts. Story 4. Our final story comes from Australia. Or maybe I just made it up. A Bernese cat named Oscar proved that he had multiple lives after surviving a grueling 12 minutes in an active washing machine. The poor little cat had his hands on the glass as he was doing the rotation, and he was just looking at me. Oscar's owner, Amanda Meredith, tells of the traumatic incident. The Queensland Australia native was first alerted to the two-year-old kitty's ordeal when she heard a peculiar meowing sound after loading bedsheets into the washer. Amanda initially thought the noise was emanating from the cupboard, but soon realized the hair-raising truth. Oscar was in the washing machine. It was tragic, said the distraught owner, who was forced to wait an agonizing two minutes for the front loader to shut off so the door could be opened. Amanda then phoned her vet, who said the next six hours will be touch and go for the cat. Fortunately, despite being beat up by the appliance's fins during the crisis, Oscar emerged from the incident without serious injury. Albeit very soft, though, according to his grateful owner. Now this one has to be more of Ron's fake news, right? Nope, this one actually happened. Oscar's veterinarian, Dan Caps later suspected that the cat might have crawled into the unit to escape Australia's frigid winter weather. He probably will avoid doing that in the future. Well, that's it for this time. I hope you found these stories truly informative, and if not, at least fun. Jungle Is It True was brought to you by Audible. 
They have more stories than you can possibly imagine, and you can get a 30-day trial and a free audiobook just by trying it out. Head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. This will also give you access to their Plus catalog, which is amazing. There are so many great titles in there that you will never buy an audiobook again. Audible has built the medium that redefines the spoken word. So head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories and begin your adventures today. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories. Special edition. Welcome to These Are Your Stories. You might be asking, how is this different from the other segment? The answer is simple. These are special. But what makes them that way? Again, the answer is simple. They deserve special treatment. It may be the content of the story or how the story was obtained. Or it could be that the storyteller himself or herself is actually here in person. No matter the how, why, or where, what you'll hear in this segment is going to be special. Our story for today was suggested by listener Gary Richardson from Modesto, California. It's not clear who wrote this, and in the end I decided to read it because it is an excellent tale. I ran it through the paces to see if it was plagiarized, and I didn't find anything. But I will say this. If you are the copyright holder, which I doubt there is one, then please let me know. If anyone has any idea who may have written this, I'd like to know that as well. The only reference I could find to the main character was a child that was born in 1891 and died in 1894. I am guessing this is not the same guy. So I say, let's get to the story. Texas is the land of many legends. Some of them are just that, legends. They have a germ of truth in them, and some may be entirely true. At one time, when I was a young man, I had the opportunity to hear what some would call a legend from the man who experienced it. Lon Schuler. He had been a cowboy for as long as anyone could remember. He was born in 1880, but wasn't sure about that. He was sure, however, that he first went up the trail with the double bar cattle drive in 1892. He said, I was just a button kid then. He worked as a nighthawk and a wrangler, and he was told that he could catch up on his sleep next winter. In 1902, on a double bar drive to Montana, Lon was with the last herd to drive on what is known as Stampede Mesa. Not many people know about Stampede Mesa these days, but from the early 1880s until Texas cattlemen quit driving beef north, Stampede Mesa was, and still may be, the most thoroughly hunted place in Texas. Go get a map of the state. One of the highway department maps will do. Look up where the eastern edge of the panhandle hits the Red River. A little east and south of there, you'll see a lake called Blanco Canyon Reservoir. On the east side of the lake, you'll see a tiny peninsula of land jutting out into the lake. That's Stampede Mesa. It isn't a mesa in the sense of what you'd see in New Mexico or Arizona. It is a somewhat rocky slope with plenty of grass. On the east side is dried up McNeil Creek. On the west side ran the North Blanco. There is a drop off there into the draw of anywhere from 6 to 25 feet and another drop off into Blanco Canyon of nearly 200 feet at its highest point. These drop offs were natural fences. A trail boss could throw his herd into the point, 
put out a light guard across the north end and rest men, horses, and cattle for a couple days with plenty of grass and water. It was a very popular place to hold a herd. Sometime in the early 1880s, a trail boss had some trouble there. A nester, unwanted farmer, had set himself up to the north of the holding pen using posts and barbed wire. When the big herd came through, the nester's cows wrecked the wire and joined the herd. Of course, that nester demanded that the trail boss cut them out of his herd. The cowboys, well, they were tired and so were the cows. The nester was told that the herd would be cut after the men had rested. He got insistent, but ended up looking down the wrong end of a six-shooter. He was told that the boss would cut the herd, and if he pushed the issue any further, there'd be no need to cut the herd, because dead men don't have no use for cows. The nester left with his drawers in a knot. At midnight, he put on a slicker and mounted his mule. He rode south along McNeil Draw until he was about centered on the herd. He then burst out of the brush, flapping his slicker, yelling, and firing his Colt pistol into the air. The result was a stampede. The herd headed west and stampeded straight for the 200-foot drop-off of Blanco Canyon. At least half the herd went over, maybe more. After the cattle were finally milled, the boss began counting cowboys and came up one short. The man who had been on the west side of the herd had gone over with the cattle. He and his cowpony were both dead. How long it took to catch the nester nobody seems to have recorded, but catch him they did. There was a debate, but in the end the trail boss made the decision. The nester was bound and tied to the saddle on his mule. The mule was then blindfolded and pointed west towards the drop-off. The nester was given a half a minute or so to make his peace, and then the boss laid his six-shooter along the mule's rump and fired. The mule bolted straight for the drop-off, carrying the screaming nester with him. The fallen cowboy was buried beneath a big cottonwood tree at the north end of the point. The nester, well, he was left to rot with the cows. The holding pen on the North Blanco got an evil reputation. Herds held there invariably stampeded to the west. If you tried to hold the area, you lost animals and sometimes men. The stampedes were caused by white things that came out of the brush on the east side. Ghosts of cattle and of cowboys? Who can say? There are many accounts from the area, but the one you're about to hear is what Lon Schuler encountered on that last cattle drive on Stampede Mesa. Yeah, I reckon I was there, Lon said. Spring of ought to it was. Me and a pal of mine, a feller named George Ramp, signed on for a drive going plumb to Montana. Got up north on the Blanco and the boss says, we're gonna hold on the point. Let me tell you, about half the crew drew their pay right then. Me and George, though, we was full of pus and vinegar and wasn't going to be no spook story that was going to scare us. Them old hands, they told us we was crazy if we stayed, but done it anyway. Me and George, we drew second watch. That's from about 10 in the evening to about 2 in the morning. We decided we'd ride a double circle, one of us going one way around the herd, the other going the other. So we'd cross twice during each round, and we could say if we'd seen anything peculiar, you know, we could warn each other. It was right about midnight and I was on the east side. That's when them things started coming out of the brush. Looked like cows, but not like any cows I ever saw. They was plumb white as milk. They didn't make no sound at all, and it didn't look like they walked. They just sort of floated by. Now, I was riding a Claybank Gelden, one of the sturdiest horses I ever had. Never knew that horse to shy away from anything afore, but he sure didn't want nothing to do with them things. The trouble was, 
is we couldn't get away from them. They was like everywhere. I hit one with my hand and it just went through. Felt like hitting into cold smoke. That's what it felt like. I hollered real loud. Look out, George, they're gonna run. And sure enough, they did. George, he was on the west side and had taken his lariat and commenced to hitting the leaders on the nose, trying to turn them. Don't let nobody ever tell you that you can turn a herd by shooting in front of them. All that does is scare them worse and make them run faster. Well, the fellas that wasn't out there with me and George, all they had to do was pull their boots on and grab their saddle horses. While we did lose about 200 head, we managed to turn them and mill them and keep the rest from going over the side. Well, that trail boss, he comes up to me a hollering, Damn it, Lon, he says. It was your hauler that started that run. I ought to pull you off that horse and stomp your head in. Now, George, he wasn't a cussing sort of fella. Oh, he'd say a word now and then, but he wasn't a big cusser. He laid into that trail boss, and I swear he called him everything but a white man. When he got through, he told that feller if Lon hadn't hollered when he did, I'd be down there with them cows. He was up here, you wasn't. That wasn't no low-flying nighthawk or rabbit nor possum loose that herd. We seen them things. They were ghost cow ghosts. That is what Lon had to say about Stampede Mesa. It is a pretty incredible story, and I believe him. Gary Richardson, who you will remember, told us about this story, had this to add. I have been to Stampede Mesa once a long time ago. Below the drop-off where the cows would have fallen, every kick into the dust brought up cattle bones. That big cottonwood is gone, and whatever markers left for the cowboys who died on Stampede Mesa have also rotted away. Over on the McNeil draw, I found the remains of tangled, ancient, badly rusted barbed wire. There were so many elements that collaborated Lon's story. Gary also told me that he went to Stampede Mesa in the daylight. He didn't think he'd ever care to go there after dark. Well, Gary, I quite agree with you, and I want to thank you for sharing this incredible story with us. A pretty fun tale, indeed. Our featured story comes from the mind of Milton Lesser. He was a writer of science fiction, mystery novels, and fictional autobiographies. He's best known for his detective character, Chester Drum, whom he created for the 1955 novel, The Second Longest Night. Lesser was fascinated by dystopian societies and often wrote about them. He felt that if we stayed on our current path, humans were destined to be ruled by one. He cited the examples of Russia under Stalin, Germany under Hitler, China under Mao, and Europe under the Roman Catholic Church during medieval times. One of the stories he wrote for Galaxy Magazine was titled The Sense of Wonder. He wanted to point out that we create our own social interactions based on what is considered to be acceptable. Think calling someone gay. In the 1890s, that had a totally different connotation than it does today. But why? What changed? I probably don't have to answer that question. Our story today looks at a society that is told what to do, when to do it, and who it is acceptable to do it with. But what if you were born different and you had your own notion between what is and what is not? What consequences would that lead to? Well, we're going to find out in the story Sense of Wonder. It has been adapted to radio by the OTR series, X-1, and it first aired on April 24, 1956. 
That's almost exactly 68 years ago. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, The Sense of Wonder by Milton Lesser. The huge ship sped endlessly through space on the voyage that had lasted 10,000 years, the journey which had no end. And for those aboard her, there was no other universe. To them, the ship was all. The ship is all. Rykwood read the slogan embossed in raised letters of steel outside the door to the priest's compartment. The ship is all. His eyes wandered to the face of the young man standing next to him, his superior, Kreifer. The face had the empty, unquestioning expression that was typical of the people of the ship. Are you ready, Kreifer? I am. Enter. Go in. Well? I am Kreifer. Superior class, third level, compartment Y-51. Welcome. This is my attendant, Rykwood. Be welcome. Praise the ship. Praise the ship. What is your mission? My superior's schedule shows that today he has 25 units of age. He is ordered to appear before the priest of the third level to be given a woman. You have the schedule with you? Here. Good. You have your certificate of health and fertility? Show him the certificate, Rykwood. Don't just stand there dreaming. Oh, yes. Here. Good. Return to your compartment. I will have the matron bring you a woman from the fourth level. Praise the ship. Praise Praise the the ship. ship. Kreifer returned to his compartment, followed by Rykwood. There was no questioning in the mind of either of them. At birth, each of the people was classified as a superior or an attendant, and the coded marking of his schedule was tattooed on his right arm. Both of these young men were 25, strongly built, and tanned from constant exposure to the health rays in the ship's conditioning room. Kreifer wore the loose-fitting robe of a superior. Rykwood wore the tight trousers and shirt of an attendant. They entered the comfortably furnished compartment. Kreifer. Yes? What do you suppose she'll be like? What difference does it make? Don't you even wonder about it? I wonder about nothing. The ship is all. Praise the ship. Well, naturally, but still... I could... We've been together as superior and attendant ever since the nursery. As an attendant, your entire purpose in life is to keep me alive and productive, to perpetuate the people. I would hate to have to part with you now. To part with me? Not of my own choosing, of course, but sometimes I detect what appears to be a strain of unorthodox thinking. Really? I was not aware of it. I am not entirely aware of it myself. Not enough for me to report you. However, I must warn you that if it should increase, I will have to send you for therapy. Well, I assure you there'll be no need for that. I've never deviated from the schedule. I have never disobeyed the buzzer. I am merely observing, asking questions like, don't you even wonder, this is the first step to unorthodoxy. I shall watch myself for signs of it. Good. Ah, the eating buzzer. Your schedule calls for a massive dose of multivitamins. Fine, prepare it in the green vegetables today. Today is a starch day. Oh, I'd forgotten. We could just skip it today. Rykert. Well... Of course, skipping the vitamins for one day is a permissible deviation, but I shall have to report for punishment tomorrow. Well? Skip the vitamins. I knew we would. You've never missed a permissible deviation yet. It's your influence that makes me do it. And you always blame it on me. That's what attendants are for. Yes, I know. Uh, That must be the matron with the woman. Open the door. Maintain the utmost dignity, please. 
Yes? Is this the compartment of Kreifer, third level, Y-51? Yes. I am matron of the woman's level. At her? I am Rykud, Kreifer's attendant. This is Kreifer. I have brought a mate for you. This is she. Be welcome. Praise the ship. Praise the ship. Her name is Aelin. Welcome, Aelin. I am most happy to be here. Praise the ship. Come. I will show you which compartment is to be ours. This way. There are five compartments in this suite. And ours will be... This... Will you take food, matron? Why do you look at me that way? That mark on your forehead. You have always had such a mark? Yes. And you have another diamond-shaped on your right shoulder? How could you know such a thing? I... Your name is Rykud. Rykud. How like him you look. How like whom? Your father. My what? Of course, you could not know the meaning. What do you say? When you were born, like any of the people of the ship, you were taken immediately and placed in the nursery of the ship. You never knew who sired you, nor did they know you. Naturally. It's according to the schedule. Yes, it's according to the schedule. I have a strange feeling toward you. I can't explain it. What sort of feeling, Rykud? As if we've met before. But that's impossible, of course. Yes. Still, there have been cases, it is almost heresy to mention it, where a mother has been able to keep her child for a while. Such a female would be turned over to the control chief and fed into the converter. If she were discovered. It is a criminal thing to do. It is said to warp the child so that he becomes a heretic at an early age. Yes, it is very, very criminal. Still, you say there have been cases. Once there was a woman, it is said, an attendant, who managed to conceal such a child behind one of the forbidden doors for almost three years. Behind the doors? It's unspeakable. Very likely only a rumor. It's shocking to hear of such things. Behind the forbidden door. You're shocked, and yet something seems to stir deep in your memory, perhaps. Nothing. You're certain? Why do you speak to me thus, woman? Come closer. What is it? Closer. Where there's no chance that we'll be overheard. Well? Rykud, you are that child. I will not listen. I will not listen. You are that child. How could you know such a thing? I am 70 units of age. 25 units ago, I was a matron of the nursery. This person came to me and told me of her child, which she had concealed in the space lock behind the forbidden door. She begged me to take it and place it in the nursery with the other children. I had been her attendant for many years, and we were close to each other. I did, as she asked. But are you certain this child was me? I remember the marks upon it. And I am doomed. Why doomed? I have known my own parent. This accounts for the strange feelings that come over me sometimes. What feelings are those? A feeling... a sense of wonder. Oh. You seem pleased. Rykud. What? Your superior returns, I cannot speak. But if you would satisfy this sense of wonder, I have a book which I will give you. I cannot accept a book without the supervision of the ship's librarian. Take this one. Keep it concealed. Here. I, no, I... Take I... it quickly. They're coming. Well, what are you two whispering about? I was merely explaining to your attendant how he must behave in the presence of your mate. There is no need to explain. All is scheduled. Nothing is questioned. Praise the ship. Praise the ship. I hope that your union will produce the optimum number of children. I'll leave now. Aylan. Yes, quite. Your duties will be very simple. Reichert will teach you how to prepare my meals and you will memorize my schedule. In three months, he will be freed from service as my attendant and he will report to the second level to find a mate in the attendant class. Yes, Kreifer. It's time for my health treatment. Teacher, Rykud. Yes, Kreifer. Come here. Closer, where I may examine you. This is Kreifer's schedule. You will memorize it. Yes. Here is a list of permissible deviations. Oh, I am familiar with it, naturally. I see. I was not aware of what training you received on the women's level. The matron trained us well. Good. You have been with the matron a long time? Ever since I left the nursery. I see. What is she called? Mara. Mara? Tell me, did she ever speak to you of a sense of wonder? Are you of the control police? Certainly not. Then you should know better than to discuss feelings. I'm sorry. I, I thought perhaps... What's that? The change bell. There has been some change. It frightens me. Oh, what does it mean? I don't know. I heard it only once before. 
When the ship passed very close to a red planet, there was a shower of stars, and the ship seemed to shake, and the change bell rang. We were all summoned to the priest and told that we must undergo a test for radioactivity. What are we to do now? Riker, Aelin, quickly. It is the change bell. We are all summoned to the priest of our level. Quickly. Within a few moments, the people of the third level of the ship were assembled in the area outside the compartment of Chul, the priest. They stood there trembling, listening, and panicked to the clangor of the change bell, not daring to wonder what it meant, but aware that something different had happened. Something different. I'm frightened. Hush! The priest is coming. The ship is all. Praise the ship. Praise the ship. Listen to Chul, your priest. I have just been in contact with the chief priest of the ship. Ah. This is what I have been given to say. For 10,000 years now, ever since the ship began the voyage, which has no end, we have lived as one people following the schedule. In those years, the change bell has rung only twice. On one occasion, it was to announce a change in the schedule for the preservation of the people of the ship following the epidemic. On another occasion, the ship passed close to a radioactive explosion, and it was feared that we had become dangerously activated. Now the change bell has rung again. You wish to know the reason, naturally. I am given to tell you there has been a change in the sound of the motor. There is no cause for alarm. The priests have consulted the book which no man may see save the high priest. And we have learned that there is in the book a provision for a change in the sound of the motors. The book says... When the ship shall enter into the orbital pool of its destination, the motors will change in sound due to the increased anti-gravity components. A study is being made to interpret the meaning of the word destination, which was lost some 4,000 years ago and has always been a subject for much controversy. But this need not concern you. Suffice to be reassured that the change in the sound of the motors is a part of the scheme of things. Return to the schedule. The ship is all. Praise the ship. The The ship ship is all. Praise the ship. On his way back to his compartment, Reichert stopped for a moment in front of the forbidden door which led to no one knew what and listened to the sound of the motors. Yes, it was true. There was a new sound was frightening, and yet at the same time it made Reichert's heart leap with expectation. He looked at the forbidden door again and read the warning. No unauthorized persons permitted through this door. Attendant? Yes. What's your name and compartment? Reichert, attendant to Kreifer, third level, Y-51. Who are you? Graf, control police. Why do you loiter outside the forbidden door? I was merely reading the warning, trying to impress it upon my brain. Is there a need to impress it? you have doubts? Well, no. No, of course not. Then why bother to impress it? If you have no doubts, there is no need to impress it. Well, I I was merely... You see, I am engaged in the training of a mate for my superior. I wish to make certain that she knows every jot and line of the warning. Has she doubts? I'm sure she does not. Then why impress the warning upon her? It should be sufficiently impressed upon her since birth. I I was merely... You were merely loitering, eh? Tell me, Rykud, do you ever wonder what is behind the forbidden door? Never. Are you perfectly content? Perfectly. Good. I'm going to enter your name in my report as a warning. See that it is not repeated. I will see. Return to your compartment. I will return. Praise the ship. Praise the ship. Reichard went back to his own compartment. He tried to push the events of the day out of his mind. It was almost too much to cope with. First the mate for Kreiper, then the news of his birth, now the change in the sound of the motors and the book. Reichard lay inside his bunk, drew the curtain, and took the tiny ancient plastic book from his trouser belt. He opened it and began to read. It was thought advisable to keep from the passengers on the ship the fact that their voyage might end in catastrophe. Forced to leave the Earth because of its radioactivity following the three wars... The inhabitants of the ship, to all intents and purposes, became the inhabitants of a new world. The ship was their world. 
The organizers of the expedition felt it would be cruel to inform them that the ship's navigation machinery had been set in a series of ever-increasing circles and then ever-decreasing circles, so that in 10,000 years, the ship would return to Earth. There was the possibility that Earth would no longer exist, or that the radioactivity would have made it uninhabitable, even if the remaining humans hadn't managed to explode it. Therefore, the ship became all. Even the word destination was eliminated. If it were known that I had chronicled this account, I would most certainly be executed and the book destroyed. Most likely, it will pass into legend and be disbelieved anyway, just as fairy tales and even biblical accounts have become tolerated but disbelieved by many who were... The sleep buzzer sounded and Reichard's eyes closed automatically. Ordinarily, the people of the ship did not dream. It was considered a sign that therapy was needed. Tonight, Riker dreamed. Rise! Rise! Dress! Dress! Eat! Eat! Raise the ship! Rise! Eat, dress. The ship is off. Rikud. Oh, no. Rikud. Oh. What? What? Shh. What is it? You've been dreaming. I heard you and came in to see what was troubling you. Where's Cryford? He sleeps like the dead. I was dreaming. Ellen, look at me and tell me the truth. Do you ever dream? Do you? Yes. I knew it. I could tell it by looking at your eyes. But you mustn't tell anyone. I won't. You were very close to the matron, were you not? Yes. Did she ever read to you? Read? Did she ever read from this? Where did you get that? She gave it to me. Then you must be one of the trusted ones. Who are the trusted ones? Some of us. The women who were with the matron since we were very small. We've been trusted by her to hear the reading of this book. I see. But if anyone found out... I know. Reichard? Yes? I... I feel... Very strange. I too. What is it? I don't know. Sometimes, after the matron had read to us from the book, I would have this feeling, strange and frightened. And she would comfort us. Comfort? What does that mean? She would put her arms around us. And did that comfort you? Yes. How terribly strange. I could? Yes. Comfort me. Put your arms around me. Helen. Please, will you? Yes. Yes, yes. On the following morning, when Kreifer went to the conditioning room, as prescribed by the buzzer, Riker drew Aelin over to the spaceport and slid aside the protective shield. Look. I am looking. Tell me what you see. I see the stars and space. Look closely. Do you see nothing unusual? I so seldom look through the spaceport. I'll tell you then. Look there. See that one star, so big and so bright that it hurts your eyes? Well? I've been watching it. It is growing larger each hour. Stars do that. Never has one been this large. What difference does it make? The stars exist only as pictures in the glass of the viewport. They're not real. The ship is all. That is what we are told, but perhaps it isn't true. What? Perhaps these stars do not exist only in the glass of the viewport. Perhaps they exist beyond the viewport. I don't understand. Let me say it this way once and forever. Perhaps, Aelin, the ship is not all. Rikard, your heresy frightens me. Rikard, hold me close. It frightens me even to look at you. Oh, Rikard, you mustn't even think it. I do think it. I believe it. I believe the ship is not all. And I believe you are a candidate for the converter. Crafer, don't move, Rikard, or I'll blast you into dust. It is bad enough for an attendant even to touch his superior's mate but to couple it with the ultimate heresy. There is nothing but death in this. Cypher, I beg of you. Stand aside, Aelin. I'm going to finish this heretic. Now, Rikard. I... Oh. 
Have I killed him? No, he's just stunned. Oh, Rackett, what can we do? I don't know. I, I... Rackett, the change bell again. Something's happening. I know what has happened. Come, we'll go to the priest. What about Kreiper? He'll have us killed. No, it's too late to think of that. Come. Me. The priest is entering. Silence! Once again, the change bell has sounded. There has been another change. Doubtless you all felt the shock and the vibration a moment ago. I am informed that the motors have stopped. Silence! However, once again, there is no need for any panic or alarm. We will continue to live our lives just as before. The only thing that has changed is that the motors have stopped and that the view in the viewports has changed. Behold. The view in the viewports has been changed from the stars to a garden. That is all there is to it. The book makes mention of the fact that the view in the viewports is changeable. Go back to your compartments and resume the schedule. The buzzer will be your guide as always. The ship is all. The, the ship, ship is, is all. all. Wait! No, I have something to say. Oh. Listen, this is what I have to say. The ship is no longer all. Seize him! Keep back! I have my superior's ray gun. I will destroy any who move to seize me. Listen to what I have to say. The view in the viewports is not just a garden. It is the destination. It is the earth. Don't you understand me? We have arrived. We have reached the destination. The journey is over. We can leave the ship and go out into the garden. Fools, can't you understand? Watch the viewport. Watch it. The viewport is broken. I've shattered it. You can go out. Feel the air rush in. Smell its fragrance. Rackett, they don't move. They don't understand. Seize him! Kill the heretic! Kill him! Rackett, they're moving toward us. Run! Follow me, quick! After him! Death to the heretic! Seize him! Seize him! Rackett and Nalan ran down the long steel corridor with the crowd on their heels. After a few moments, they came to the forbidden door of the control room. Aylan, quick, in here. Like it, it's forbidden. I'll have to blast the lock. <laughs> Quickly, now come. Now, help me close the door. Now the bar. We're safe in here for a while. Not even the priest can make them come in here after us. It'll take them time to figure out what to do. I could look. Look at the machinery. It's frightening. We're in the control room. It tells about it in the book. You see this big machine here? There was a drawing in the book. This is the machine that controls the buzzer. Just a simple machine like that? Yes, a simple machine. Stand back. What are you going to do? Do? I'm going to smash it. Now. Now they're going to have to find a way to live without the buzzer. Like they're breaking down the door. Come with me. Where can we go? There's nothing except the ship. No, there is more than the ship now, Ellen. There's the earth. The cool green earth. I'm going to smash the viewport. Come on. We're going to leave the ship. Why could I'm frightened. Put your arms around me. There's nothing to be afraid of. Come, Ellen. Take my hand. Here is the earth. And it is ours. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features a story by F.L. Wallace titled, Mesereau Loves Company. When Marcus Mesereau set out on his mission to Earth, he was driven by pride and indignation, plus a practical reason. But if he'd known what lay ahead, he might have decided to let bad enough alone. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. 
Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Sense of Wonder, based on a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Milton Lesser and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were James Monks, Bill Quinn, Edwin Jerome, Vera Allen, Rita Lloyd, Joe DeSantis, and Dick Hamilton. Raymond Edward Johnson was the narrator. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. So, what are your thoughts on this one? I'm thinking that it's highly plausible. The idea that people will remain after a great war is almost a certainty. But how would they live? Probably underground with extreme rules. X-1 aired on NBC from 1955 until January of 1958 for a total of 124 episodes. There was a revival of the series in 1973 when radio was attempting to bring back the radio drama and it lasted until 1975. The show occupied numerous time slots throughout its run and thus was never able to generate a large following. X-1 was an extension of Dimension X. In fact, the first 15 scripts used were from Dimension X. However, it soon found its own little niche. The stories for the show came from two of the most popular science fiction magazines of the time, Astounding and Galaxy. Adaptations of these stories were written by Ernest Canoy and George Lefferts. They even wrote a few original stories of their own. This series has survived from its original airing in very high quality, and they can still be enjoyed today. You can find what remains of them on the Internet Archive. I highly recommend them. Well, it's time again for me to make a plea. The story coffers are getting low, which always happens in spring and summer. To compensate, I usually go into the past and pull tales from previous podcasts. I either reuse them or even revamp them like I did today. But I would much rather have your new stories. So if you've been holding out or are new to the show, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com. Hit the story submission banner, leave your story, and I will do my very best to read it on the show. I can even help you write your adventure. Thank you for listening to... Ron's Amazing Stories. That was episode number 636, and our listener story was found by Gary Richardson. Thank you, Gary. All of the stories used on the show are sent in or suggested by you. So, please, why not take part in the fun? If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.